We all hedge all the time, right? Might, could, possibly, seems, all of these are words that indicate some level of uncertainty. And while it's good to use these words sometimes, they undermine our impact. We looked at uh, hundreds of thousands of online reviews, for example, and a variety of different types of social interactions. And we found the more people hedge, the less likely other people are to listen to them. We got to ditch the hedges, right? If we're trying to communicate uncertainty, that's fine. But if our goal is for other people to listen to us, well, then we got to stop hedging so much. Often we hedge without even thinking about it, but those hedges are, are hurting our ability to persuade. Welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast, Jonah. Thanks so much for having me back. I am excited. Yeah, bam. Jonah Berger is a Wharton School professor. He's also the best-selling author of Contagious, Invisible Influence, The Catalyst, and his most recent release is called Magic Words. He's a world-renowned expert on natural language processing, change, word of mouth, influence, consumer behavior, and why things catch on. He's published articles in top-tier academic journals. He's keynoted hundreds of major conferences, and he's also consulted for household name brands like Apple, Google, and Nike. We had Jonah on the show in episode number 158, Change Anyone's Mind. We discussed how to change anyone's behavior and we learned about Jonah's come up story. It was one of my favorite conversations of last year. So be sure to go back and check it out. In this episode, we're going to break down Jonah's newest book, Magic Words. We're going to dive deep into how to persuade, communicate, and connect. And we'll cover the different types of words that can increase your impact in every area of life. So Jonah, let's dive straight into it. Whether we're trying to persuade a client, motivate a team, or even just talk to our peers, words are powerful. They're how leaders lead, salespeople sell, parents parent. And in your latest book, Magic Words, you say by some estimates, we use around 16,000 words a day. So tell us why are words so magical? You know, in anything we want to do, we use language. If we're a salesperson, we're trying to turn a prospect into a client. If we're a leader and we're trying to motivate or uh, get a team to do something in our personal lives, uh, if we're going on a date, if we're talking to a spouse or partner or child, we use language to convey whatever we want to communicate. As you mentioned, language is how we communicate, how we connect, how we persuade. We spend a lot of time thinking about the big stuff we want to talk about, the topics or ideas. If I'm getting up in front of a company, for example, I might say, this is what I want to get across. Or if I'm uh, on a date, I might want to make myself seem a certain way. But while we seem uh, and think a lot about the topics we want to communicate, we think a lot less about the individual words we use to communicate them. And, and, and that's actually a mistake because subtle shifts in the language we use can have a huge impact. Uh, as I talk about in the book, research shows that adding just a certain particular word to a request can make people 50% more likely to say yes. Research I and my own uh, colleagues have done that uh, found that rather than saying you like something, saying you recommend it makes people around a third more likely to take your suggestion. And a variety of other research shows that the language you use in email predicts whether we're going to get promoted or, or fired. The language we use when applying for a loan predicts whether we're going to default on that loan or pay the money back. And the language other people use can give us insight into whether they're telling the truth or, or what type of person they are. And so across every domain of our lives, language is a powerful tool we can use both to influence others, impact others, as well as make our, ourselves better, better off. And so if we understand the power of magic words, we can use them more effectively. Yeah, I'm super excited for this topic because I feel like it's relatable for everyone. Like everybody can use this skill and there's so everybody much to learn. Everybody uses words. Yeah. Yeah, everybody uses words. And then also just the fact that it's just these little tweaks and, and some of them are, are obvious and some of them are really not obvious. And so I'm, I'm so excited to get like through some of these gems and really dig deeper. But let's start with how you were inspired to write this book. <laughs> So I was wondering to, I was uh, reading your book, right? And you mentioned your son Jasper's first magical words was peas. And that really sparked your interest in terms of the power of words. Tell us about this story and if that inspired to write that your book or, or what inspired you. Yeah. So I've been working in this space for the last 10 years or, or so and, um, uh, you know, used language um, in my in my academic research. Um, we now are able to study language in ways we couldn't before, right? So we've always used language. Language isn't new, but now everything is transcribed and recorded, right? We share opinions online uh, on social media. We talk like we're talking now and these conversations can be transcribed. Um, whatever language we use, is now available to researchers to analyze. And there are all sorts of computational tools, machine learning and otherwise that allow us to analyze these things. And so 
the past 10 or 15 years, um, I and my academic work have been studying language. We've looked at hundreds of conversations, um, uh, thousands of sales pitches um, uh, and startup pitches, and tens of thousands uh, of pieces of content to understand what makes language uh, more, more effective. But um, I really saw it at a personal level um, uh, with, with my sons. As I was mentioning a few years ago, um, our first uh, child, Jasper, was born. Um, and around a, you know, a year or so old, um, he started saying the word peas. And what he really meant was the word please, but he didn't have his L's yet, so it came out yeah. sounding, sounding like peas. And and the fact he was using peas by itself is, is not that surprising, right? By by his age, you know, kids often have a, a number of different words that they use. But what was super neat to me is, is the way he would use this word. So um, he had a variety of things he might want, yo for yogurt, brow bear for brown bear, up for when he wanted to be picked up. And he would use one of these words to alert you that he wanted that thing. So if he wanted yogurt, he might say yo. Uh, or if he wanted brown bear, he might say brow bear. But what he noticed is if you didn't jump up right away to do what he wanted, he would add the word peas at the end. So he would look you sort of mm-hmm. dead in the eye and say, yo, peas, and, and shake his head yes. Um, and, and what was so <laughs> neat to me about this is really the first time he realized that language had power, right? That, that, yeah, if he didn't get what he wanted, he could use this word, this particular magic word, peas, and he'd be more likely to, to get it. And so that's just one example, but these magic words are around us in all aspects of our lives. And so it was really a great example to me of, wow, if we pay attention to these words, if we use them a little bit differently, we can increase our own impact. Yeah. And I love what you were saying before you were sharing the story, you were mentioning that, you know, you guys have studied so many conversations, so many things online, content pieces. Can you talk to us about how technology has enabled us to really analyze language nowadays? Yeah. So let me give you an example. So we did an analysis recently looking at tens of thousands of pieces of online content, right? So imagine news articles, imagine blog posts, whatever it is. Um, And we don't just have what was written. We have how far down that content consumers, readers actually read, right? And and this is amazing. We've always read newspapers and magazines, but there's no data looking at, well, how far down people read. But as content creators, we all want to know, first, how do we get attention? Second of all, how do we hold it? Right? If we're going to post something on social media, how do we get people to pay attention to it? If we're going to send out emails, how do we get people to open them? But then second, once they've taken a look at our social post or opened our email, are they actually going to read it or not? Right? For most of us, we don't just want them to open the email or just click on our social post. We want them to actually pay attention to the content for that content to have impact. And so we got access to over a million read events of these tens of thousands of pieces of content and how far down people read. And we used natural language processing to look at styles of language that shaped that, that outcome. And so I talk some of this in the emotions chapter and the certainty chapter, but there are now all these tools, what are called natural language processing tools or automated textual analysis that allows us to parse language data for for insight. Rather than having to read each of those articles, which would take me a lot of time, the computer can essentially sift through that mass of data and look for statistical statistical patterns, not only using dictionaries or topic modeling, uh, but also word embeddings and other techniques, some using machine learning, some not, to to leverage uh, that data and, and look for insight. And so it's a powerful way to allow us to uncover things that have always been there, but we've we've never been able to see it. Mm, that's that's so exciting. So you have a new book called Magic Words, and you uncover six different types of words that can make us more impactful, more persuasive. We're obviously not going to get through them all. We just have an hour together. But I thought a good warm up question would be to talk about the word because. So from my <laughs> yeah. understanding, there was a study from the 1970s using a copy machine in the library at the City University of New York. And the scientists who were conducting this study, they were trying to figure out what drives persuasion and actions. And they found out that using the word because can really influence behavior. So I thought this could be a good warm up question so people can start to understand the power of subtle changes in your words. Yeah. Yeah. And so because is just one one simple word, but but this speaks to a, a broader question, which is often we're hoping that someone else will do something that we'd we'd like them to do. Right? As an entrepreneur or salespeople, salesperson, we're trying to convince someone to, to buy something or, or use something. As a startup founder, we might be trying to convince people to fund us or work for us. As a boss, we're trying to motivate uh, employees. As a, a colleague, we're trying to get support for our initiative. As a, um, in our personal lives, we're trying to convince people all the time. How can we be, we'd be better at it? And so there was a study that was done, as you nicely mentioned, in the sort of 70s, um, where they went up to people at a copy machine. And I know no one uses copy machines anymore, but they, they went up to someone at a copy machine 
And they basically interrupted them and, and asked to, to make copies. And, and not surprisingly, most people said no. Right? If you're in the middle of doing something, someone walks up to you and says, hey, can I use the copy machine? Most people would say no. And so they wondered, well, could we use language to make people more likely to say yes? And so for some set of people, they just went up and said, hey, um, uh, can, I, can I interrupt you and, and, and make copies? Uh, for another set of people, they, they came in and said, hey, um, uh, can I interrupt you and make copies? Because, and then they gave a reason. And what they found is the people who used the word because, other people were 50% more likely to say yes to agree to let them interrupt the, what they were doing and have someone else do something. And you could say, well, but hold on. That's not just about the word because, right? I mean, there's, there's more there. There's, there's the because and then there's the, the reason. I'm actually working on a piece right now for the, the Wall Street Journal where the editor came back and said, well, it's not, it's not the word because, it's, it's the reason, right? But here's what's interesting. For a third set of people, they used because and they used a terrible reason. So I said, hey, I'd like to interrupt you making copies because I'd like to make some copies. The, the thing after the because was, was empty, <laughs> right? I, I, I want to interrupt you because I, of course you need to make copies. That's why you're asking in the first place. And yet because still had that, that impact, still increased the percentage of people who said yes by about 50%. And so it's not just the reason. And I'm not saying the reason never matters. Obviously it matters sometimes. But just using that word because makes it seem like there is a reason. And even if that reason isn't great, people are more likely to, to go along. And so that's just one example uh, of the power of words. If we, if we get to it, I could even talk about some examples where even just shifting a couple letters can increase our impact. But that's a simple thing we can do to increase our, our influence. Yeah. Well, let's get into that. Let's talk about the importance of um, changing things to verbs, noun to verbs. I know that's yes. really important. And that's, that's your first <laughs> bucket of words. It's called activate identity and agency. It's your first category yeah. of words out of the six types of words that you call magical words. And so you mentioned a study where scientists ask, ask a group of four and five-year-old kids to tidy up a room, and some of them just asked them to help, and some of them referred to these kids as helpers. And apparently, changing a noun to a verb can have really big impacts. So talk to us about that. Yeah. So, so backing up for just a second, as you talked about, there's kind of sure. six key buckets or words that, that I talk about uh, in, in the book. And to help us remember what those buckets are, I put them in an acronym, uh, and that's uh, SPEAK, um, S-P-E-A-C-C. -C. I wasn't clever enough to come up with a K, though, as somebody pointed out, K is always the tough letter in Scrabble, so I don't, I don't feel so bad. But um, the <laughs> S stands for the language of similarity and, and difference. The P is the language of posing questions. The E is the language of emotion. The A, as you just mentioned, uh, is uh, words that evoke uh, identity and agency, uh, is the A. Um, and then uh, the Cs are the language of confidence uh, and, and the language of, of concreteness. And so um, let's dive in, as you, as you said, to kind of the language of agency. Um, and as you mentioned, there's this great study that asks, asks people for help. And, and in some ways, it's, it's like the copier study in that we're trying to get people to do something, right? In that case, they're trying to get, you know, four and five years old uh, to, to clean up a room. And so a bunch of stuff on the floor, books, crayons, all sorts of different things. They're trying to get the kids to clean up. Some kids, they ask them to help. Can you help clean up? As we often would do. And other kids, they say, hey, can you be a helper? Now, mm. to put a, a pin in it, the difference between help and helpers is really small, right? It's not a, a completely different word. It's only adding two letters on the end of the same word, right? Helper is help inside it with the words, uh, letters E R at the end. But that led to a 30% increase um, in students' likelihood of helping. And it wasn't just kids in a classroom, right? Similar things have been found with, with adults. So a few years ago, there was a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they tried to get more people to vote. And obviously, we all know that we should vote, yet we don't always. And so they sent um, notes out uh, to people saying, hey, uh, please go vote for some people. Go vote, the, the verb vote. And for other people, they said, be a voter. Mm -hmm. And again, the difference between vote and voter is infinitesimally small. There, it's only one letter, adding an R uh, to the end of the word vote. Yet it led to about a 15% increase in people's likelihood uh, of turning out. And so you might say, well, well, why, right? Why did this subtle difference matter so much? Um, and the key insight here is, is about turning actions into, into identities. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, voting is an action. Helping is an action. We, there are many actions that people ask us to do or take all the time. And we know we should vote and we know we should help, but we're, we're pretty busy. So we don't always take those actions. But what we care about more than actions are identities, right? We care a lot about how we see ourselves 
how other people see us. Um, uh, you know, we want to be seen as attractive and smart and athletic and knowledgeable and all these different things. And so if actions are an opportunity to claim desired identities, to show ourselves and others that we hold those identities, well, now we're much more likely to take that action. Helping, yeah, sure, it's, it's a good thing. But as, if helping is an opportunity to be a helper, well, now I'm much more likely to help out. Similarly, voting, I know I'm supposed to vote, but I'm, I'm so busy. Well, hold on, if voting is an opportunity to be a voter, I'm much more likely to do it. And so one way to, to, to motivate people to action is to turn those actions into identities, right? Rather than asking people to lead, ask them to be a leader. Um, uh, mm. They're much more likely to do those things because it seems more permanent. Same thing is true on the negative side, right? Um, losing is bad. Being a loser is much worse. Cheating on a test, cheating on a test is bad, but being a cheater is, is much worse. Uh, and so when we want people not to do something, framing those negative things as identities makes people less likely to do them. There's, um, uh, mm. you know, uh, you guys remember, maybe remember the campaign, don't be a litter bug. We all know we shouldn't litter, but being a litter bug, well, that's a really negative thing. I'm, I'm less likely to, to do it. And so this can even impact how we see ourselves. If I, if I told you about two people, I have one friend who runs and another friend who is a runner, who would you say runs more often? The runner. The runner, right? It's a yeah. stable part of who they are. It's an identity. If someone says they drink coffee, yeah, once in a while they have a cup of coffee. They're a coffee drinker. It must be who, who they are. And so we want to motivate ourselves. Well, let's use those identity labels, right? I'm a runner is going to make me run more often. Rather than talking about oneself as creating things, I think YouTube and other platforms have done a good job of, of turning it to a name. You're a creator, right? Well, that sounds like a stable a, a job. You're not just innovative. You're an innovator, right? When we're describing mm -hmm. ourselves on a resume, don't just say we're hardworking. We're a hard worker. It seems much more permanent, just like a runner is more permanent than running. And so people think we're much likely to follow through on what, what we've suggested. If you're not on LinkedIn, you're missing out. People who use LinkedIn are highly educated. They're making a lot of money and they have money to buy. You may not know that I'm one of the biggest influencers on LinkedIn. If you are interested in leveling up your game on LinkedIn and 10xing your results, you've got to check out my LinkedIn Secrets Masterclass. In this class, I teach you everything about personal branding, the psychology of design, copywriting, the LinkedIn algorithm, sales hacks, and so much more. Learn how I was able to scale my company to $5 million in revenue in less than two years with no paid ads and just using LinkedIn. If you want to level up on LinkedIn, you've got to check out my LinkedIn Secrets Masterclass. Go to yapmedia.io slash course and use code YouTube to get 30% off the masterclass today. Act fast because the session is filling up and I'm capping it at 100 seats. I'll see you in class. Yeah, this is so interesting. And I feel like it can be applied in so many ways of life. Marketing materials to motivate your team, like as you're talking to customers, like you said, to motivate yourself. There's so many ways that we can apply this. And it's such like two, two adding two letters to a word can like make all the difference. It's just so surprising. It is. And I think it relies on the behavioral science of identity, right? And, and you started by talking about nouns and verbs. And I, I know that's how I talk about it in the book, but I try not to say nouns and verbs because let me tell you, I don't even always remember exactly what a noun is and what a verb is. But this idea of actions and identities, I think is, is, is clear to us, right? We all have desired identities and undesired identities, right? Um, I was just talking to someone and they said, oh, you know, I use this all the time when I talk to people who are disappointed. So if somebody loses, they might think they're a loser, somebody fails, they might think they're a failure, right? As, as who they are. And instead I say, look, you're not a failure. You just failed this one time, right? You got to get mm -hmm. up and try again. You're not a loser. You just lost this particular game. I, I coach kids soccer on the side. And so, um, you know, when talking to kids or talking to members of your team, if it's a negative thing, don't frame it as that identity, right? Frame yeah. it as more as an action, a thing that happened as less persistent will, will make them more motivated. Yeah, I love that. So like positive things, you want it to be part of an identity so that people can align to it and do more of the positive actions. Negative things, you want to make it seem like it's a point in time. It's not who exactly. you are. It's just yeah. happened. Yeah. States I love and that. traits, right? Positive things are traits. They're persistent. Negative things are states. They happen, but it's not who you are. Mm, love that. Okay. So let's talk about the words I don't versus I can't. What do we need <laughs> to know about that? Yeah. So, um, Often, when we're trying to stick to our goals, uh, whether it's a goal to lose weight, whether it's a goal to exercise more, whether it's a goal to you know, spend less time on a particular app or doing a particular thing, often there's temptation. 
right? We're on a diet and someone will say, do you want some chocolate cake or do you want to go out and grab some pizza, right? And often we want to say no, but, but how should we say no? Um, uh, and there's a, a great professor, her name is Vanessa Patrick, um, and she has a, a book coming out, I think in the next six months or so, all about better ways to say no. And she has some great, great, great research on it. And, and she shows that if you ask people, rather than saying, I can't do something, so, hey, would you like some chocolate cake? No, I, I can't, right? Saying I don't, I don't eat chocolate cake rather than I can't eat chocolate cake. I don't eat chocolate cake makes us much more likely to, to stick to our, to our goals, right? Um, uh, if you're trying to you know, work on something, not I can't go out Friday night, but I, I don't. Uh, I don't go out. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to go out this weekend, right? Don't rather than can't works because it makes us feel in control. Can't mm. sounds external. Right? Um, oh, yeah, I can't do this because this external thing is getting in the way. Right? If you had to fill in the blanks, you know, um, uh, I didn't do whatever because I can't or I don't, can't things are often external. Right? Uh, I can't eat the cake because I'm on a diet. Um, uh, I, you know, I can't go to the party because I need to finish some, some work. Right? It suggests you, you want to go to the party, you want to eat the cake, but this external thing is preventing you. Whereas if you say, I don't, now you feel more in control. The agency, that, that A in the framework, it's your agency, right? I don't eat chocolate cake, right? Uh, you know, I don't go out when I've got to finish a project. This is who I am. I'm in the driver's seat. I'm in control. And so I feel more powerful and it helps me stick with the things I want to do already. And so even a subtle shift here, again, one word, can't versus don't, can impre- uh, impact our, our success in our own goals. Yeah. And I think it makes sense because it's essentially you're in alignment with your values. You have this value and you don't do this value. It's not because it's the wrong timing or it's because this person asked or it's the situation. It's your value that you don't break yeah. no matter what. So I, I can not imagine that would make you feel more powerful and confident if you stick to your values. I love the way you said it in terms of value. I was really recently dealing with a, a consulting client that that asked me to do something, and I was thinking about this can't versus don't. And I, w- I was going to say, you know, I, I can't or or we can't, and then I was like, you know what? Actually, we don't or I don't. It's just much. This this is how it is, right? Th- these are the the guidelines we live by. This is what is possible, and and this is what isn't. And um, you know, hey, it makes me feel more certain in myself, but it also makes clear. Look, it's not about you. It's not about this specific time. It's about who, who we are as an organization. Um, and so it's often much more effective. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to read a quote from your book. You, you write, although 60% of CEOs in one study said that creativity is the most important leadership quality, 75% of people think they're not living up to their creative potential. So please talk to us about how we can become more creative by fostering a could mindset instead of a should mindset. Yeah, this is again something that happens to us all, all the time, right? You know, I'll be working on a project and I'm stuck, right? I'll be working on a chapter of a book or a paper or a solution for a consulting client, and I'm, I'm not sure which way to go. I'm not sure what to come up with. I need to, um, you know, I do some brand naming work. I can't come up with a, a name, or I'm doing some marketing consulting work. I need to think about the right way to apply the strategy. And I'm stuck. And and this happens to us all the time, right? Clearly happens at work, regardless of what role we have. It also happens in our personal lives. Sometimes we're trying to make a tough decision and we're we're stuck. And problem solving is difficult. It's difficult to be creative, particularly under under pressure. But as you noted, um, it turns out that, again, a shift in just one word can increase our, our effectiveness. There was a nice study um, out of Harvard, uh, Harvard Business School where um, they brought people in and, and asked them to sell, solve a tough problem. And for some people, they asked them to think about what they should do. And this is how we solve problems all the time, right? We often ask ourselves, what should I do? I'm choosing between two jobs. Which one should I take? I'm considering mm-hmm. two apartments. Which one should uh, I, I go with? Um, I'm two strategies. Which one should uh, I do? And so half the people took that traditional approach. For the other half, they changed just one word. They said, instead of thinking about what you should do, think about what you could do. And they found that for people in this could group, the second bucket, not only did they come up with more creative uh, ideas, but they came up with more effective ideas overall. And, and, and could works for, for a couple reasons. First, it basically widens the possibilities. We're not just thinking about, okay, what, what's that one right answer? Should often narrows us, right? Which should I do? There's one right answer. Could widens us. Well, what's possible? And even if all those things that are possible aren't the best idea, we, we, that's not the best thing to choose at the end, by thinking about those possibilities, it helps us come up with a better, a better answer. And so whether we're talking to a team, right, and they're facing a tough problem rather than saying, hey, guys, you know, think about what you should do. Let's think about what we could do before we come up with a final solution. Or, or for ourselves, 
right? When we're thinking about it, okay, well, what could I do? I could do this. Um, thinking about those options will, will help us reach better solutions. Yeah, I really like that advice because basically could enables us to release like all the resource constraints, right? You don't think about like, well, like the money or the people oh, involved yeah. or the time involved. You're just like, okay, what could I do to solve this problem? And then you can think about the what's good or bad resource wise and where you want to spend your time. So I think that's great advice. Okay. So let's move on to confidence. Okay. So you have a second category of magic words, words that convey confidence. And I'm a speaker myself. So I understand that displaying confidence is really important and making sure Sure that you speak with power is really important. And Trump is somebody who people love and hate, right? But at the end yeah. of the day, he was an impactful speaker. That's why, you know, he went from being somebody that everybody sort of hated to becoming president, right? So talk to us about what Trump did effectively with his persuasion and speech. Yeah. And so, you know, just as you said, I think about this a lot as a, a communicator, we're, we're all communicators in, in one way or another, whether we're standing up in front of a room um, and pitching our idea, whether we're standing up on a stage and talking to an audience, whether we're talking to one person and trying to get them to support our, our idea, we're often communicating things. And we all have someone in our lives who's really charismatic, right? Whenever they talk, other people other people listen. I wish I was this person. I'm, I'm not this person, but I can definitely think of two people in my, in my own life that are this way. And so what do they do that makes other people listen, right? When they open their mouths, everybody listens. How, how does that work? And so in, in the book, I talk about um, uh, Donald Trump. And, and uh, I don't want to get into politics, but whether you like Trump or you hate Trump, you can't deny that he's done an amazing job of selling his ideas, right? If you like him and you like his ideas, fantastic. How did he make it work? And even if you hate him, well, even more reason to figure out, well, even if you don't like his ideas, he got a whole bunch of people to support those ideas. Why? What did he do to get people to support those ideas? Uh, and if you look closer, there's a speech he made, for example, when I think he um, announced his initial president uh, run, where he said something like, you know, if elected, I'm going uh, to build a wall, it'll build a great wall, and I'll do it very cheaply. Um, and, you know, we don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but now we don't. Um, take, you know, China and our trade deals. Um, you know, we're losing on this trade deal. I beat China all the time, all the time, right? And he sort of had this speech talking about his different ideas. And it was met with different responses, right, depending on political beliefs. But at least some people said, look, it's, it's overly simplistic. It's bluster. There's nothing there. Yet a year later, he was elected president. And so even if you feel like there's nothing there, he clearly did something right. W what is that thing? And if you look closer, you'll notice he does the same thing that great salespeople do. He does the same thing <coughs> that great entrepreneurs do. He does the same thing that gurus do, which is that he speaks with a great deal of certainty. And what do I mean mm. by certainty? Well, um, certain things are obvious. The answer is clear. This will definitely work. This is absolutely true. Everyone agrees with X, Y, Z, right? He uses certain language to communicate his, his points. And, and there's been some research um, that shows the benefit uh, of certain language. Work on financial advisors, for, for example, shows that, hey, people are much more likely to pick an advisor that speaks with greater certainty, even when that person is not clearly right, right? They're right an equal amount of the time. The fact that they speak with more certainty makes people want to work with them more. Why? Because regardless if someone's right or not, the fact that they speak with so much certainty, it's hard not to believe they could be right because they seem so sure, right? Mm. They seem so clearly sure of what they're saying. Well, I, I must, they must be right. I should go along. Contrast that with what most of us do most of the time. And I, I am guilty of this um, more, than, more than anybody. You know, when I work with consulting clients, someone will say, what do you think about this strategy or, or what's the right direction? And I'll say something like, oh, I think that's a good idea. This might work. It seems like this could be a good possibility. I use what are called hedges and we all hedge all the time, right? Might, could, possibly, seems, all of these are words that indicate some level of uncertainty. And while it's good to use these words sometimes, they undermine our impact. Right? Often without intending to, by using these words, we make ourselves less persuasive. We looked at uh, hundreds of thousands of online reviews, for example, and a variety of different types of social interactions, and we found the more people hedge, the less likely other people are to listen to them. And the reason why is, well, people sit there going, hey, look, you don't seem confident in what you're saying, and if you're not even confident in it, why should I follow your, your advice? And so as communicators, first of all, and I talk about a few different strategies in the book, but at least one is we got to ditch the hedges. Right? If we're trying to communicate uncertainty, <coughs> that's fine. 
But if our goal is for other people to listen to us, well, then we got to stop hedging so much. Often, we hedge without even thinking about it, but but those hedges are, are hurting our ability to persuade. Mm. This reminds me so much of, uh, I had Kelly Roach on the show and she talks about conviction marketing and the importance of having convictions in your market marketplace and really standing by them. And this reminds me a lot about it because if you're an expert and you don't strongly believe in, in what you're saying or doing and you're speaking in this way, like I think this might be, or, or, you know, in my opinion, it's like you either believe this is the way for people or not, especially when you're trying to be an expert or a thought leader. No one's going to follow you if you're uncertain about what you're saying to begin with. So you need to just believe in what you're, the advice you're giving and say it strongly. Hey everybody, this is Hala from Young and Profiting Podcast and I'm live in Las Vegas at Podcast Evolution. I want to tell you about Go Box Studio. I remember I was at a podcast conference a few months ago and Go Box Studio had a booth at the conference and I see this amazing equipment and I was like, oh my God, I have to get a Go Box Studio. This is exactly what I've been searching for as a content creator. I'm always traveling now, speaking, going to conferences, and I need to be able to shoot my podcast as well as my commercials on the go. And I never really had an all-inclusive portable studio or solution. Everything was really piecemeal. I'd be lugging around all this equipment, trying to stuff it in a suitcase, and it never really worked, which meant that I wasn't able to shoot interviews or commercials while I was on the go. Now with GoBox Studio, I can do that and more, and it always looks professional. And GoBox Studio is a complete game changer for me. So GoBox Studio comes in this like awesome looking suitcase. You can actually roll it around in the airport. It comes with two professional lights, a professional camera. It comes with two wireless mics and it's everything you need for a professional studio, whether you want to record podcasts, IG reels, TikToks, whatever it is, it's got it all for you. Just hook up your computer and you're ready to go. Now, whenever I travel, I'm always going to be bringing my portable studio, GoBox Studio. If you guys want your own GoBox Studio, if you want to take your content creation to the next level, if you want to create on the go, go to goboxstudio.com slash yap and use promo code yap at checkout. I think that's exactly right. And the only thing I would add is sometimes people say, well, what if I am uncertain? Like, what if it's not clear what the answer is? And, and what, what I like to talk about there is, well, let's own the uncertainty, right? Like when a consulting client asks me for advice, right? I have a strategy I think is best, but there's often some uncertainty about how they'll implement it. Well, let me call that out. I think this, rather than saying, I don't know, I'm not sure, I think this strategy might work, why not say, I think this is the best strategy, but for, for it to work, we need to do these three things, right? Mm. For this to happen, these other things need to occur. I'm really certain about what needs to occur for this, this to work, but um, uh, I'm not saying I'm uncertain about the strategy itself. I'm very certain about the strategy, and I'm certain about what we need to do to make it work. And so by owning that uncertainty, we can, in some sense, both indicate that, hey, some things have to happen, right? But mm -hmm. it's not that we don't think it's achievable. We do think it is. We need everybody else to get on board. Yeah, that makes sense. So my next question is um, not in your book necessarily. I had Robert Green on the show. I'm sure you know who he is. He was uh, one of the first interviews that I ever had on the show. And one of my first viral episodes, we talked about his 48 laws of power. And he's got this okay. law number four. And it's always say less than necessary. And his <laughs> logic is that if you can't control your words, you can't control yourself. The more you say, the more stupid you may appear. And he also says that if you want to sound really profound and smart, you should be really simple and vague and open-ended and sphinx-like. And even if something's obvious and boring, if you are really vague when you say it and sort of succinct, people will believe you more because they, they're they like, well, you know, they'll try to be like a mind reader. Like, what does he really mean with, with what he's saying, right? So do you have any thoughts about that? Like all this research that you've done with magic words, uh, agree or disagree? I know Robert came out with this book a long time ago. So yeah. So, so I would say a few things. And, 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 and the main thing is um, I try not to have opinions. I try just to look at data. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, you know, when I, when I write a book, um, and I know there have been many language books written before, um, I try to say, here's the academic research, um, and here's what, it, here's what it shows. And, and to be clear, not every type of language is good in every situation, right? Even, even take the language of certainty. Research shows that when we're trying to get somebody who, who disagrees with us strongly to meet in the middle, 
sometimes it's actually better to show a little bit of uh, uncertainty there because it makes them feel like we're open to opposing viewpoints. And because they feel like we're open to opposing viewpoints, they're more likely to listen to what we have to say as, as a result. And so sometimes the answer is it depends. It depends on a, on a couple of things. I, I think to, to what you mentioned um, that, that he suggested, you know, I think there's certainly times where being um, simpler in our language is, is better. Um, uh, I think, though, that there's a difference between simplicity and shortness. Um, and, and let me give you an a- example. So, you know, often we, when I, when I work with clients about making messaging simpler, they say, well, let's just cut down the number of words. So I still say, hey, there are four things you need to know or 17 things you need to know, but now I'm going to give each one a sentence rather than five sentences. And I often say, well, well, hold on, we've cut the length down, but it's equally complicated. We haven't, we haven't reduced the complication. And so making things simple is really not just about shortening them, but relentlessly prioritizing. Right, particularly if um, mm-hmm. you're trying to figure out what your value proposition is as a company, not saying, well, we do nine different things, but saying, well, what's, what's the most important one? Right? Sure, there's a second most and a third one, but let's rank them. And it's not that the ninth most important isn't important, but it's the ninth most important, which means it's less important than the eighth and the seventh and, and so on. Mm-hmm. And so that relentless prioritization helps us when we have to be simple, say, well, let's just focus on the, the most important thing because we can't focus on everything. And so I completely agree that being simple is key. I think sometimes short can be confused for simple and they're actually two separate things. Yeah, 100%. And I know that people can't remember a whole lot, you know, give or take five five or seven things, right? So um, making sure that your points are succinct are definitely important. Okay, so let's continue on in terms of understanding uh, confidence here. So let's talk about using less filler words. You say that we shouldn't hesitate. A lot of us are used to saying ums, uhs, you knows, that's right. Why yeah. shouldn't we use these filler words? And do you have any advice in terms of how to get rid of them? Because I think a lot of us have this problem. I, you know, someone was talking to me recently about this and they said the challenge with the language of confidence is that sometimes it can come off badly, right? And so they made the point, look, you know, if you're an, an older uh, white male, uh, maybe when you seem confident, that's good. But maybe when you're uh, a younger um, uh, and, and non-white female, maybe it's a little bit harder for, for confidence to be digested. If I'm a young person in office and I'm a, a young woman, maybe my older colleagues don't want me to seem uh, overly confident. And I said, I completely agree when it comes to hedges, right? And sometimes speaking too directly and, and removing hedges can, can seem too confident. But I, but I disagree when it comes to, to fillers. And that is that many of us fill conversational space. We say, um, we say, uh, we say like, um, and by removing those things, it's an easy way to, to make people like us more and, and think we're more professional. It, it's hard often to see um, uh, our use of fillers um, when we speak. I do it all the time. When you, when you ask a great question, I might sit there going, um, uh, like sort of buying myself time as I'm thinking. Um, mm-hmm. But when we see it on paper, we go, oh my God, look at these things. I was working with a, um, a coaching client and they're a salesperson. And we were having these interactions over Zoom because it was during the pandemic. And eventually Zoom came out with this new feature that would allow you to get a transcript uh, of that conversation. And uh, we're trying to figure out why the sales pitch wasn't working. And when you looked at the transcript, it was just painfully obvious, right? Every other sentence, there was an um or an uh, and it's just a, a bump in the conversational conversational flow. And so let's get rid of those, those fillers, right? Um, rather than just saying it because it's easy, pause for, for a second. And I, um, mm-hmm. you know, to the earlier comment about um, being uh, short and concise, being powerful, I think pausing can be really, really powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm bad at this, terrible at this myself. But if you look at folks like, uh, you know, great speakers like Barack Obama or others, he often uses pauses for a really powerful effect, right? Pausing can be a great way to show that you're thinking, to provide emphasis. Um, and so rather, if you need to think, no problem, right? We often need to think, but let's think through pausing rather than sort of filling it in with something that makes us not look as good as a result. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is like, listen to yourself. A lot of people, I don't think, take the time to actually listen to what they sound like on a presentation or on a podcast episode or whatever it is. Like, even if it's painful, even if you hate listening to your voice, go back, record yourself and listen to yourself. So one more question on confidence and we're going to go on to questions. Uh, Let's talk about the importance of using the present tense. I thought this was a really cool hack. Yeah. So, uh, Think about something that that's happened. So uh, a job candidate comes into the office, and you can say uh, they seemed good or they seem 
good. Um, uh, you come back from a vacation, you can say the beach was beautiful or the beach is, uh, is beautiful. Um, mm. Many times we describe things using past tense, what happened. Um, and it turns out using present tense is, is more persuasive. Um, when we say the food was good, it makes it seem like, well, at that particular point in time, uh, that experience I had, the food was, was good. If I say the food is good, it says, well, wait a second, it is good for all time and everyone else will have a good experience as well. And so using present tense um, uh, showcases the certainty that we have, makes other people feel like we're, we're more certain and makes them more likely to listen to us as a result. Yeah, I feel like this this theme of certainty is just popping up uh, with this confidence uh, section. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the third category, ask the right question. So I had Robert Cialdini on the show. He's known as the godfather of influence and persuasion. And he talked about something that you also talk about in your book, which is the importance of asking for advice, right? And a lot of people are scared to ask for advice because they think it's going to make them look stupid and competent, but actually it has the the adverse effect. So talk to us about the importance of asking questions and asking for advice. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, again, guilty of this as, as anybody else is, but I think often we're worried uh, if we ask for advice, we'll bother someone, they won't be able to, to answer uh, what we have, or even worse, they'll think negatively of us, right? They'll say something like, oh, why don't, why don't you know the answer uh, your, your, yourself? Um, and so we think that asking for advice is a bad, uh, bad idea. Um, uh, but it turns out that it's, it's not. Um, uh, there's some very nice research um, uh, out of Harvard University uh, that had a bunch of people have different social interactions. Um, and uh, for some of them, uh, people asked for advice and others they didn't. And they found that asking for advice actually made people look better not, not worse. Um, uh, uh, and one question is, well, why, right? Um, why would asking for advice make you look better? And, and the reason is very simple. We're all egocentric, right? We all think we have great ideas. We all think we give uh, great uh, advice. Um, and so when other people ask us for advice, we go, oh, wow, that person's really smart because they asked me for, for advice, right? Um, and so by asking for advice, right, we take advantage of the fact that people think of themselves uh, positively, uh, and take advantage of that to help ourselves out as well. Okay, cool. So uh, I would like to ask a more general question. A lot of the people who listen to my podcast are entrepreneurs, they're side hustlers, and a lot of them are just involved in sales and love this the topic of sales. So can you just give us your best advice after all this research, this great book that you put out? What can we do better in terms of language for sales? Yeah, I mean, I think as you nicely said, um, pay attention to your pitch, right? Whether whether you're a communicator, a speaker, a, a podcaster, whatever it is, right? We use language all the time. We don't see it. Record it, listen to it, digest it, unpack it. Think about, okay, well, am I using a word like can't or don't? Am I using, uh, telling something in action or an identity? Really dive down into what the pieces of what you're trying to communicate are, not just the topics, what you're trying to say, this is a great product. You should buy this. You're going to like this. That's fine. How are you saying it? What are the words or language that you're using to communicate those ideas? By, by delving deeply into the exact words you're using and the, and the ways you're using them, we can all increase our effectiveness. Are there any words in sales that we should never use? <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't say there are words we should never use. I, I would say, and I think this is somewhat obvious already, but, but start with understanding, right? Too often as, as sales folks, you know, we want to basically drop off the pitch. I want to send 100 emails um, uh, with the same information in each of them and assume somebody will, will bite. And while that seems efficient, it's often not very effective overall because it's not tailored to our, to our audience. The more we understand our audience, the more we understand what they care about, why they might be interested in what we're offering, the more effective we can be as a, as a salesperson. Got it. All right. I'm going to close this interview out with the same two questions we ask all our guests. The first one is, what is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? Yeah. Pay, pay attention to language. We use it all the time. We are all speakers. We are all writers, whether we get on stage, whether we write books and essays, or whether we just write emails or just speak to clients and colleagues. We are all writers and speakers. By understanding the power of language, we can increase our impact. And what is your secret to profiting in life? <laughs> I, I think, uh, and, uh, and now you, people can go back and listen to the other episode and see, see whether I said the same thing. But, but I think what I would say, <laughs> and sorry if I said the same thing before, is it's always just great to be curious. There are always, almost anything out there is interesting if you look at it long enough. Um, and so I think being curious and, and having curiosity is, is a great skill. Awesome. And where can everybody find magic words and learn more about you? 
Oh, thanks. Yeah. So um, uh, the book is available wh wherever uh, books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, local independent booksellers, whatever you like. Um, folks can find me um, at jonaburger.com. There's not only more information about the book, but also a whole bunch of free resources. So that speak framework that we talked about, a one pager about it, um, uh, a guide for using language more effectively, asking better questions, all of which uh, should be helpful. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jonah. Thanks for having me.